Ever heard that, uh, that saying, you can catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, but what about when you want to catch fewer flies? Hmm, interesting. That's kind of what today's deep dive is all about, right? Yeah. Negative punishment. Yeah. We're going to be unpacking this idea of like how removing something can actually lead to some positive changes in behavior. Yeah, it's interesting because like the word negative mm -hmm. sometimes throws people off. Right. But it's not about like, you know, doing something bad. It's about taking something away. Right. Exactly. And our source has actually had some really interesting examples of this in action. Um, one that comes to mind is Ruth, right, who was talking about how she kept like accidentally closing out her videos because she was hitting the wrong button. Yeah. Yeah. But once those precious videos, you know, went away a couple of times lesson learned exactly so the consequence there right was that the video went away and she was less likely to press that button again that's negative punishment in a nutshell uh, but we also had like kent who missed out on those like front row concert tickets because of something he did oh see that stings more to me than losing a video yeah probably like i i would definitely be rethinking some life choices after that absolutely and that's the really key point too right is that Whatever is removed or the threat of it being removed, it has to actually matter to the person. Totally, yeah. Like that's really a key component to uh, to any negative punishment working. For sure. Um, but to get into some specifics here, you had pulled some material about two main ways that this is applied, right? Yeah, yeah. We're talking about timeout and response cost. Yes. Yeah, there's always, there's always seemed... Um, like a little tricky to wrap my head around and to get right <laughs> so time out. So we're not just talking about like sending someone to their room for a little bit. Like there's actual like I don't know, method to the madness here. There is. There is. It's a structured intervention. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just giving somebody a break. Right. It's the temporary removal of access to really all reinforcement following a specific behavior. And what was really interesting is that they broke it down even further. OK. Into non-exclusion and exclusion timeout. OK, yeah, I've heard those terms before, but remind me, like, what's the distinction there? OK, so imagine, uh, you know, a therapist working with a client mm -hmm. and the client's being disruptive. OK. So in non-exclusion timeout, mm -hmm. what they might do is just, like, turn their back to them for a minute. Interesting. OK. Right. So they're still present, but they're removing their attention. Oh, that's a good. It's a subtle shift. But what it's doing is it's removing that positive reinforcement of their engagement. Yeah. OK. So they're still in the environment, but they're just like cut off from the stuff that they would find, I guess, rewarding or whatever. Exactly. OK. And there are other examples of this, too. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you think about uh, a school cafeteria that has a noise meter. OK. Yeah. And it's tied to the music system. Uh -huh. Green light. Music's on. But if it hits red. Music's off. I love that. Right. It's very clear. And that's terminant specific reinforcer contact. Right. right. So it's directly tied to, again, an undesirable behavior. So it's like you said, like taking away the good stuff when the when the bad stuff happens. Yes. OK. And then, um, you know, we also have like contingent observation, which always makes me think of like, you know, basketball. Like when you get a foul and you got to sit on the bench. Yes. You're still part of the team. It's still there. But you're definitely not getting a high five right now. No. And that's kind of the same thing, right? You're still present but you're removed from the activity that's reinforcing the undesirable behavior. Gotcha. And it's an opportunity to kind of observe and learn from, hopefully, the positive behavior of others. Okay. Okay, so that makes that makes sense. So that's like the non-exclusion side of things. Right. But then what about exclusion timeout? Is that where things get a little more, well, exclusive? In a way, yeah. So this is removing the individual from the reinforcing environment. Okay. Uh, and the classic example that everyone always goes to is the timeout room. Right. 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 Where it's like this very kind of neutral environment. It's intended to minimize any potential for any type of reinforcement. Right. And so, I mean, that's something that, you know, on the surface, it's like, OK, I get it. But I, I'm sensing there's some nuance here that we need to, like, unpack. There is. Because as much as the timeout room can be helpful in reducing disruptive behavior, it's really an area where careful consideration and ethical implementation are absolutely critical. Yeah. And why is that? What are some of the concerns there? Well, there have been, you know, some legal cases that have highlighted that potential for misuse and that if it's not done very carefully, it can kind of turn into a little bit more of um, 
an isolation type of thing, right. especially for prolonged periods. And this is especially important when we're talking about, you know, vulnerable individuals. And and I imagine those concerns are even more heightened, right? When we talk about like hallway timeout, which sadly I've seen way too often. It just seems like, uh, I don't know, a recipe for, for things to go wrong. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah. And I think um, because of that, you know, Many experts, even some school districts, have moved away from that practice entirely. Okay, yeah, that that makes sense, just given, like, the lack of supervision and the fact that, like, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And on top of that, I can't imagine it's actually effective in changing behavior, you know, for the better. And I, I think you've hit on a really crucial aspect of using time out effectively mm. in general, and that is the importance of what we call a reinforcing time-in environment. So it's not just about what's taken away during the timeout. It's about what they're coming back to. Yeah. Like, why is that so important? That is a really good question. So for timeout to be effective, the time in environment like, has to be a place they actually want to be. Okay. Because if it's not reinforcing in itself, then the timeout kind of loses its impact. Right. Mm, like if, if you don't like it over there either, what's the, exactly, yeah. what's the point? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like trying to motivate somebody by saying, Say, so, well, either do this or you're going to be stuck doing that. But that isn't even something that they mind. Right. Yeah. So it really underscores the need to kind of think about that overall environment and that you're reinforcing those positive behaviors yeah. and that this is a meaningful consequence and not just a like a random timeout. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. OK. That makes that makes sense. OK. So that's kind of the rundown of timeout. So what about response cost? Because <laughs> we were talking about that. So that's less about where someone is and it's more about what they lose, right? Yes, exactly. Response cost is like a targeted penalty, basically. So after a specific amount, uh, after, sorry, sorry, specific amount of a reinforcer is removed after a particular behavior. So you can kind of think of it like a parking ticket, but instead of money, it's something that that individual actually values. Okay. So that currency could be anything, right? Mm. As long as it matters to the person, it doesn't have to be like, you know, dollars. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so it could be tokens. It could be points, um, minutes of a preferred activity. It could even be something as simple as slips of paper. Okay. There was that one case study in one of the sources we looked at about how, um, you know, they were trying to decrease complaints, I think it was, with this one student. And every time he complained, they would just remove a slip of paper with his name on it. Wow. And that actually worked. That's amazing. That is so interesting because it shows that, like, you don't necessarily have to go, like, you know, crazy with the consequence to make it effective. It it's just has good. to be, like, the right consequence. Exactly. And, again, it comes back to that individualization. Yeah. What works for one person isn't going to work for another. And that kind of makes me think about that other example that we were looking at with um, the father and his sons who kept arguing at dinner. Oh, Yes. Yes. You remember that one? Yeah. Because he like, instead of taking away money that they already had, he was like, okay, here's this potential bonus you can get. Exactly. But like, you know, watch out. And that's actually called bonus response cost. Interesting. Where you start with like this surplus that's specifically designated for removal. Oh, that's really smart. Right. So it feels a little bit less like punishment and more like a game that they can kind of, you know, win. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Totally. Yeah. That's a really good that's a really good strategy. Yeah, because it's not like you're constantly being penalized. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. OK, so but I'm curious, like what makes response costs so effective, though? Why is it that like, you know, this is something that people have found to be so useful? I think it comes down to like the immediacy of it and the clarity. OK, so like you're removing something right then and there. There's no ambiguity about it. And so it's very clear feedback that, hey, this choice that I made resulted in this. Okay, so that cause and effect is like very, very clear. Exactly. Okay, but like any powerful tool, I imagine there are also downsides if it's not used very carefully. Absolutely, and I think that's true of any of these. Right. Um, you know, there's always a risk of potentially triggering, uh, you know, aggression, um, avoidance. You know, if, mm -hmm. it's, if it's too harsh or it's inconsistent, it can really backfire. Imagine like if you felt like you were constantly being penalized all the time. You would just give up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that kind of makes me think about when we were talking about treatment integrity as well. Yes. And, what does that even like? What does that mean in this context? Yeah. So treatment integrity is really just like making sure that it's being used the way it's intended. OK. So that it's fair. It's consistent. 
um, that you're monitoring for unintended consequences. Right. Because we don't want to accidentally discourage positive behaviors along the way. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So you're not just setting up the system, but you're actually making sure that it's working the way it's supposed to. Okay. Yeah. For that specific person. For that specific yeah. person. Yeah. Yeah. You know, okay. That's a that's a good point. What other like what other downsides are there? Like, are there other things to watch out for? Um, let's see. Well, I think one is that um, sometimes you can accidentally reduce a desired behavior along with the one that you're targeting. Oh. So, like for example, um, you know, if if a student is losing points for calling out in class, they might also be less likely to participate at all. Oh, okay. Even when it's appropriate. Right. Right. So it's like you had good intentions, but then it's like now they're now they're not they're not talking at all. Exactly. We don't want to end up stifling their overall engagement or anything. Right. So again, it comes back to making sure you're individualizing that approach. You're really carefully selecting that target okay. behavior, um, and that there's a rich environment again where other positive behaviors are being encouraged and reinforced. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like we've got these two main approaches then, right? Timeout, which is more immediate, and then response cost, which is more about like shaping behavior over time. So like, how do you know when to use which one? Yeah. It really comes down to, you know, matching the strategy to the situation, mm -hmm. right? And the individual. So like, if you need to interrupt a behavior right now, and you really need to provide a clear consequence, timeout, especially those non-exclusion ones, can be super effective. Like hitting the pause button on the on the reinforcement before things like escalate. Precisely. But, you know, if you're looking to reduce a problem behavior over time, maybe even help someone learn to self-manage a little bit better. Response cost, you know, with its kind of system of consequences and rewards might be a better fit. OK, so time out for immediate and then response cost for the for the long game or. Yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. But, you know, these are guidelines. In real life, it's not always so black and white, right? Yeah, yeah. Every individual is different. Every situation has its nuances. Totally, yeah. Well, yeah. works for one person, like, could totally backfire with somebody else, right? Exactly. So, like, being adaptable and responsive and, and you know, just always, always, always keeping those ethical considerations top of mind. Couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think a key takeaway here is that punishment, even when it's done thoughtfully and appropriately, <laughs> should never be the only tool in our toolbox. Right. And needs those supporting characters. Right. Like we were talking about with that positive time in environment. Exactly. Exactly. That's essential. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately our goal is to support these individuals, to help them develop those positive behaviors and, you know, reach their full potential. And that often takes, you know, a multifaceted approach. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Wow. We covered a lot of ground today in this deep dive on negative punishment. It's been a uh, it's been eye opening for sure. Any uh, any final thoughts for our listeners out there who are, you know, navigating all of this? Yeah, I think it's just so important to keep in mind. We've been really focused on the how to today, but you know, it's just so important to consider the potential impact of this right on on the person's overall motivation, their sense of self and especially their relationships with those who are the ones delivering those consequences. I think that's something really important to reflect on. Such a good point, because it's not just like we're dealing with these isolated like actions, but like these are whole people with with feelings and relationships that are, you know, all a part of this. Exactly. Yeah. So understanding that impact, both positive and negative, mm -hmm. is just absolutely crucial for using these techniques in a way that's ethical and effective. Absolutely. Well said. Well, huge thanks to all of you for joining us for this deep dive on negative punishment. We hope you found it insightful and helpful. Keep exploring, keep questioning, and as always, keep learning.